Good afternoon and welcome to our third and final session on fairness. Um, as you've heard throughout the day, if you choose to use a machine learning model to make credit decisions, you've got a lot of choices to make. You have to decide what kind of machine learning model you're gonna build, what level of complexity you want to enable and can manage. And you'll have to decide on strategies uh, for making sure you can understand the behavior of the model in a variety of con contexts. Each one of those decisions is consequential. Each one involves complex math. Each one involves advanced technologies. But when it comes to fairness, on the other side of all that math and all that technology, arguably we're dealing with a very simple equation. You have a person who wants a loan on one hand, and on the other, you have a financial institution that would like to make it. Today, we'll talk about the implications of machine learning underwriting models for both of those groups. And then we'll take up the role of regulators who are tasked with defining, monitoring, and enforcing fairness expectations. In this conversation, I'm joined by three executives from companies that participated in the research, as well as a subject matter expert. Let me introduce them briefly in turn. We have uh, Sri Ambati, the CEO and co-founder of H2O. We've got Jay Budzik, the Chief Technology Officer of Zest, and Nick Schmidt, who is CEO of Solus and the AI Practice Leader at BLDS. Our subject matter expert, we're joined by Michael Akinwumi, the Chief Tech Equity Officer of the National for Housing Alliance. I welcome you all and thank them for being here today. Um, let's start with what the use of a machine learning underwriting model means for that person who just wants a loan. What are the implications for them that a lender would have made the choice to use a more complex model? What does it mean? Jay, do you want to kick us off on whether more accurate models have implications here? Yeah, for sure. Thank you. And thank you for having me, Pinar. Um, so uh, we find often that just switching from a uh, standard national credit score to a machine learning model can drive uh, really significant increases in approval rates for folks that have uh, historically been uh, unrepresented in the uh, credit ecosystem. So anywhere between a 40 and 50% increase in approval rate for African-American and Hispanic borrowers applying for loans. So at the same level of risk, you can let more people uh, who have been historically excluded in because the models are more accurate that's because they're able to consider many more attributes and use more sophisticated math to make more accurate predictions. Are there fairness implications for another group of people, uh, those who might have been given a loan that they can't afford? Well, absolutely. And, and when we think about fairness, uh, we have to consider both sides of the coin. So um, you can't, you could build a lending practice that just accepts everyone. And then the people that have no ability to repay are going to be really negatively impacted by that uh, decision. And so you need to think about, well, what am I doing from an approval perspective? Am I getting more equal in my approval rates for people while simultaneously considering whether the models are accurately assessing those people? Are, am I, are my false positives going up? And are my false negatives uh, uh, going up? And, and what can I do to mitigate giving people loans that they can't actually repay? Um, Michael, we heard a little bit about the benefits of machine learning underwriting models. I also know there are many, many concerns. Anyone who reads the newspaper has read something scary about AI. What in this context, credit underwriting, given the history of financial services, should we be worried about? Oh, thanks uh, uh, for, you, for your question. Now, in terms of uh, what we need to be concerned about or worried about, I actually really like to uh, start with, uh, you know, the concept of accuracy. It was nice hearing Jay talking about uh, the false positive rate and all that, right? And you also mentioned, uh, you know, uh, the rules that people were actually rejected uh, from these underwriting systems would necessarily uh, play. Right. So what the very first uh, concern that I think uh, we should all have is uh, what I call sample bias. Right. So you have, I mean, uh, Jay uh, mentioned uh, the need to extend loans to those who have the ability to pay. Right. Now, 
we also need to think of how, you know, the fact that we have populations that are not represented in the data, that are not visible or considered to be unscorable, right, or new to credit, uh, could actually have when it comes to how we measure or define what it means to have the ability to actually pay. So that, that's the very first one, uh, you know, sample bias. We want to make sure, so yesterday from the presentations, we we'll learned from Nicole the concept of traumatized data, right? And I, I think that's really, really important. And uh, even, uh, you know, uh, Moham uh, referenced my comments yesterday about building or factoring the histories behind the data into trying to understand the processes that generated that data. So sample bias, it's one of the things that we need to focus on. And the second one is when it comes to like the context of fairness or accuracy or trying to find trade-offs and all that. So we need to think about a univariate versus multivariate approach to algorithmic fairness. For example, in housing, we have more than one protected class, right? Though oftentimes the argument is about race, but then we should also think of other protected classes. So we need, depending on what act you're looking at, Fair Housing Act, for example, we have some protected classes. And if you're even looking at uh, Equal Credit Opportunity Act, there is more. And when you go to different states, there are also protected classes that vary by state. So we need to uh, not just think that because we have an algorithmic fairness technique, that does so well on a particular protected class, just single one, then we should just wave our hands and then hope that everything will work for other protected classes. So that's another concern that we need to be worried about. Now, the next one is uh, disparate treatments, right? So, and, uh, you know, traditionally, if you're dealing with simple models, you talk about, you know, the variables that go in, you visually look at this or do qualitative analysis, right? But uh, you know, one of the parts of uh, machine learning models is because we can actually explore the interactions between multiple variables. And you know, one of the risks there is the risk of proxies, right? So we also need to be concerned about the potential of introducing uh, proxy variables or proxy attributes as we actually include some of these variables into our machine learning models. Now, the next thing is I'm going to talk about. Um, Again, what I call like the reject inference or reject pool, right? Now, to date, and you know, my four panelists are Nick and Jay, and sure you can correct me if I'm wrong. Like, even though in uh, many financial institutions there are sophisticated methods that you could use to do reject inference studies or analysis and then see how you can learn from the signals of those who are considered to be invincible, right? Now, I also think we need to look into fairness techniques or even explanatory techniques that actually leverage from the signals of those who are actually rejected or who are part of the reject pool. Now, the next thing that I'm really going to mention uh, that we need to all be aware of is, I'll just call it, uh, you know, uh, popularity cause, uh, right? Or however you want to call it, maybe even popularity are blessing, right? Now, when you look at uh, machine learning or AI algorithmic systems, right? So I always think we can reduce it into just any algorithmic system into three components, right? And that's, you think of the input, you think of the output, and then you also think of what lies in between, which is like the math, like uh, you mentioned, reducing it into some equations, right? Now, we've done a good job of trying to focus more on the input, like what goes into the system. And for example, disparate impact doctrines also focus on what comes out of the other, which is the output, right? But we also need to pay attention to the math itself, right? So for example, one of uh, my favorite analogies is, you know, when I was coming to this place, I was driving to this location. So all I needed to do was just my destination, my address, where I was going, I entered it as input, right? And then I found myself here, which is the out of my desired uh, location, right? But, you know, I also need to pay attention to how Google Maps decided, okay, this is the route I should take though there are other alternative routes, right? So the fact that we have uh, algorithmic fairness techniques that are popular should not stop us from exploring other alternatives because that's how we can actually innovate those who are rejected from the bias data into the, uh, you know, the pool 
and then also redefine or expand how we define what it means to have the ability to, uh, to meet your mortgage or credit obligations. And do you mind if I jump in? So uh, I really appreciate that, that point. And one of the things that I like to think about is just as we would model uh, data generating the process or think about what the data generating process is, and I don't know if this is a good term or not, but I think about what is the discriminating generating process. And you can think of that the true outcome, then you know, what is a model? It's, it's the true outcome is a function of the function and then the input variables and then what was not included in the variable variables. And each of those can contribute to discrimination in a different way. And so I think that for us to really have a holistic view of fixing discrimination, the first thing to do is to look at the model or look at what you're trying to model and say, okay, where can discrimination come in the label? Well, where can that come, come in it is, you know, if the uh, minorities that are in the pool have experienced predatory lending in the past, then when you build a model, your accuracy is building in that predatory lending. It's also, and this is the really scary thing to me, is you are building in any discrimination that happened between when the measurement of the particular variables occurred and when the outcome, the, the, the default or non-default occurred. And if, you're, if you have variables that in that model that are correlated with protected class, and there is some completely exogenous discrimination process going in, when you go and put that model into production, you are actually discriminating by anticipating others' discrimination. Yeah. And so there are all these different ways that discrimination can creep in. It's really terrifying to me because not only is it difficult to diagnose, difficult to do anything about, but it has different sources. And, and so just looking at solutions one way is not sufficient. Yeah. That's very helpful, Nick. And you push us towards the sort of framework, what do lenders need to know and what do they need to do? Three, can you walk us through this approach to sort of unpacking the black box from a fairness perspective? What kind of information does a lender need to be equipped with to identify fairness problems and do something about them? I think um, as the rest of the panelists, all of them have um, conveyed very um, succinctly, right, sort of uh, how do we find out the reason codes for disparate impact or addition that's adverse. And kind of when, when lenders are beginning to make those advance, adverse action notices, they're looking for some reason codes essentially and where machine learning has come in, right? So we have seen that more than one feature now um, when Nick was going with a small number of features in the past to a large number of features playing a role in a decision and some of them probably um, inadvertently uh, leading to kind of this, a, a kind of a bias that's uh, picking up, being picked up that's already there in the data. And I think that's where I think some of the tools that we've recently come across with ex fully directly explainable machine learning models, interpretable models that like the explainable gradient boosting machines to kind of more recently uh, XNNs, uh, or even going back all the way to simpler models that can clearly um, show why addition was made. And if that particular addition actually was disparately impacting a protected class, uh, how do we go back and actually um, adjust and, and um, repopulate the data in a way that it's not accentuating the original fairness or in unfairness that's been captured? or a century of, um, of decisions. Right? So, so I think trying to use both the tool chain, the latest new methods, 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 uh, we prefer pre-interpretable models, but post-hoc post explanations are just kind of the latest um, tools in our toolkit. But I think that the ultimate um, uh, challenge that the, the uh, community is facing is that the data itself has captured as um, as we caught the incredible word yesterday, traumatized um, data and traumatized outcomes. 
uh, data has captured a century of um, of, um, of decisions. And I think how do we take that and start working to create a validation framework that is guarding against the model weaknesses against different um, different uh, natural problems in the data and fit and fill for those blind spots. I actually really like to add to your comment about post hoc analysis or post hoc tools, right? So one of the things we learned from our groups yesterday is when it comes to post hoc tools or analysis, the damage is probably already done, right? And when we think of the social technical guidelines that are being uh, that are put together by NIST, uh, what we know is that if you wait until you have your model output before you start doing post hoc analysis, then the damage is already done. So I think uh, we also need to be in favor of techniques that are actually look into that are pre-designed, uh, uh, and then also in processing techniques that don't wait until you finish building the model because thinking of how to actually mitigate some of the decisions. So that's just the point that I like to reiterate. Nick, maybe um, you can walk us through what tools are available for lenders to identify fairness problems and mitigate them with less discriminatory alternatives. Sure, so I think that what you wanna remember is that the, this has got to start from the beginning, data acquisition and in terms of the tools that are available, there's so much more that's out there in data visualization, understanding uh, what features are, being able to assess how they are related to protected class status, things like how, how frequently are they missing? What is the effect of missing values? Um, and, and one of the most difficult things there is there's just too much information. Ultimately, fairness is requires a human touch. And these visualization and data and understanding tools do help make that better. But this is a place where the lawyers are really good. Um, having a lawyer in the room to look at things and say, this is gonna be a problem. Um, having, but, but also having a diverse viewpoint. I mean, I have an, an example of, of something where I've, I've worked in this industry for a long time and heard an example of something, didn't think it was a problem for about 24 hours. And then it was like, oh, wow, that, that could be a really discriminatory variable. And that's because I'm a white guy, middle class, grew up middle class, you know? And, and so having diversity there is the question was about tools, that's about people, but the tools are important to understand this massive inflow of data. Once you get past deciding what data the modelers have access to and can use, then you get into building models. And in my view, modelers should not, when they start building models, have access to protected class information. Uh, it's my belief and from my experience, what I've seen and what history has shown when you allow people to do this is even if they have good hearts, they make bad decisions. Um, and so having the model developed without understanding or knowing what protected class information is there is I think essential. So modelers should use the tools that, that they're given. Once they get to a point where they have a model that they would go with without having to deal with us pesky compliance folks, that's the point at which either the modelers or fair lending analytics people should get access to protected class information. And that's a point where I, th I think Jay has a perspective that is, is actually, I don't know that it's all that different from mine. Um, I think hopefully I'm, I'm right that SAS uses adversarial biasing. Um, I'm skeptical of whether or not ECOA allows that. Um, I think if, if my client, if regulators were clearer with it, then my software product would jump in and use it as well. Uh, but it doesn't. And, and there are other techniques, feature selection, hyperparameter tuning, choosing different algorithms. And I think the exciting thing about the FRL paper and then the Stanford paper shows that those are very effective tools. Um, you can use those and you can play against the protected class information and develop a fairer model. 
Once you get past that point and you've got a model that meets business needs and is fair, then it becomes mono. And is not all that difficult. It's looking at the metrics that you've chosen, is taking the standards that you have, um, really applying this sort of SR-11-7 framework to fair lending and fairness, and going out and testing and making sure that the models are meeting that, those criteria. The one other thing though of that has really become an issue in machine learning is usage creep. Everybody is so excited about these models, perhaps deservedly, that they want to throw them at everything. And that may or may not be good, but it's very easy for a model that was not fair lending tested because it wasn't really within the scope of fair lending testing. All of a sudden, that's getting used for a purpose that has consequences under the COA. And one of the ways that I see this happening is fraud. And virtually every fraud model that you look at will have an age effect. And why does it have an age effect? Because older people are subject to um, fraud, you know, um, elder fraud. And so the models have disparate impact and they probably should. Uh, but you move that into a credit context and suddenly you have credit models that might have age effects. And that almost certainly is not a good thing or not a valid thing. And so the monitoring at the back end is essential as well. Uh, uh, just look, sorry, but I, uh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, uh, okay. <laughs> I just I, I, I agree completely. Like the you have to be very deliberate about uh, applying the models and the techniques to the right tasks. And as for you know uh, us at Zest, we did pioneer the usage of adversarial debiasing to take the bias out of models. All models have bias. Uh, because the bias is present in the data. And so even if you use a simple quote unquote interpretable model, which I would maybe argue with whether even simple models are interpretable, um, you still will result uh, in a disparate impact causing lending practice on the basis of that model. And so all models need a process by which you can look at the disparity, measure it, and then do things that are effective in mitigation. One of the things that I thought was really interesting about the Stanford study is that it showed that the conventional wisdom of uh, being able to identify the drivers of disparity, that that would allow you to then mitigate the disparity wasn't really the case, that you needed a more sophisticated approach like adversarial debiasing to take the uh, disparate impact out of models. And then uh, I just would uh, close my comments to this saying, you know, many of our lenders do have these models in production. And what they did to get comfortable with the co risks and the regulatory acceptance issue was to talk to their regulators about using them uh, and, to, and to engage in a dialogue that was productive and transparent with the regulators about the goals that they were uh, attempting to achieve by using models that created less disparate impact. And so they got comfortable. You want to uh, yeah, so I uh, actually want to touch on three points. Uh, so Nick, you mentioned missiness, uh, monitoring, and uh, Jay, you also mentioned taking bias out of the model. So I'll start with the first one, missiness, right? Like uh, in one of the uh, ongoing research that we actually conduct at the National Fairhouse Alliance, what we realize is that when you view missiness across different protected classes, the nature of missiness or pattern of missiness actually vary, right? So, and uh, what I see in practice from data sciences is they take, uh, you know, missiness uh, methodologies and then blindly apply that across different. So it's very important that we're intentional about how we fill in some of these missing data across different uh, protected groups because evidence is there to suggest that different protected groups have different uh, missing patterns. Now, the next thing is on monitoring, right? So um, it, like you rightly said, I'm always in favor of monitoring the prediction or the creation of your models, but it's also important not to focus only on the outputs. Like we learned yesterday, uh, one of the common uh, you know, practices or popular practices at financial institutions is monitoring the distributional uh, drifts, right? But it's also important to monitor the drift in the underlying features. 
Now, when I talk of underlying features, I'm not talking of just the input, because like if you use sophisticated models like deep learning, the fact that you, know, you could explore or exploit interactions between variables, you may not really eventually know what uh, features are being. So those uh, need to be uh, monitored as well. Now, the third point is about taking bias out of the model or the data, right? Now, one of the thought, uh, you know, I mean, questions that I actually have, and we're also getting to the point where we investigate it. And, you know, I always like to give out like free research ideas. So please, if you're a researcher out there and you want to explore it, that's fine too. But I always think, okay, well, if we take bias out of the data or we take bias out of the model, does that mean we now have a fair model? Because I still think in addition to removing the bias, be it from the data or the model, we still need to be intentional about how we train the model to actually be fair, mm -hmm. right? So that's uh, another point that I think I should have. So, so uh, just responding to that, um, I think it's really important to uh, recognize that in most lending use cases, we don't actually know the protected basis. That protected basis is estimated by another algorithm. And that algorithm introduces a problem of missingness into the analysis. So most of the time we're using a method known as uh, Bayesian improved surname geocoding, which leaves maybe 30 or 40% of the records unlabeled because the names don't occur on a census uh, name list. And that missingness leaves us blind to disparities that may be occurring in those unlabeled records. And so in the first instance, it's, it's sort of important that we uh, get the ground truth right about who is protected and who is not so that we can be more effective at identifying the disparities and also mitigating them. Yeah, you know, in our scene, we're actually, sorry, in our scene, we're blessed because some of these are protected classes, uh, information are actually collected, right? Now, again, uh, given, I mean, just in addition to my previous comment, right? We have, uh, you know, techniques that try to that predict our race, but I also think we should also investigate techniques that predict all that protected uh, classes. Absolutely, well. absolutely. Sri, I'm curious, we're hearing a lot about sort of the deep details of financial services practice. I know H2O works with clients using machine learning and AI models in lots of different sectors and applications. What's your reaction to this part of the fairness conversation? I think, I mean, when we started looking at explainability in 2015, 16, right? Sort of, um, interpretation is like um, interpretability score is an actual button on the H2O product, right? Sort of gives speed, accuracy, and interpretability. I think for us, interpretability started mostly we wanted to understand when mo as all models are wrong, some models are useful some of the times. Um, I think we basically think we think that interpretability as almost a table stakes necessary to debug models gone wrong, right? To actually understand the behavior of models, understand the underlying um, kind of density uh, um, plots inside the data, right? So how do you start giving, building conceptual soundness into modeling, right? So whether it is uh, healthcare or Zillow or financial services or at real estate, across every place, what we really are chasing for is there something that the model has generalized about the data that can actually be uh, true. Um, I mean, kind of going towards finding some causation, but obviously causation, causality is a little harder goal to set for ourselves as an industry, but at least get to a point where the model is capturing soundness where minor changes in data, drift in data, is not going to impact the decision dramatically, right? And, and, and I think that kind of ability to kind of build the model as you're doing the model building, break it down, um, bring some, as you do, divide the test and train, for example, um, build um, uh, safeguards, safeties to get that robustness for modeling so that it can actually um, survive um, some extreme uh, within a within an envelope be uh, reasonably um, kind of predict both predictive but also predictable in its behavior and I think that's kind of where the real goal is and in healthcare obviously a lot more things are involved 
and it's much more harder to kind of get um, get uh, interpretability into data at the inference level than to get um, uh, in interpretability for the models themselves. The mathematical algorithms are actually relatively um, the easier part of the journey. It's the it is the applic application of it. It's the human behavior, uh, human um, kind of the original bias in the data that's um, much more harder. And I think, I'd, I mean, um, you've heard around the table different techniques um, um, such as uh, adversarial debiasing or techniques that uh, backtesting, continuous validation of models so you can figure out where the model's weaknesses are. Uh, we've heard about um, uh, a common problem is um, uh, income, right? So if you take the income um, column and the average income of many protected, protected classes are very, very differently from the average income of, of the rest of the data. So if that's a missing value and you've suddenly inserted a common um, value, you may get very different results. And I think those are the kind of things that are the common pitfalls in doing data science that make lending a very, um, uh, I mean, lending can, getting a loan for education can change several generations of life, um, 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 quality of life for, for families. So I think lending is an extreme, um, is, is one where you can clearly measure, but in healthcare, uh, in real estate, in kind of um, manufacturing everywhere, I think if the businesses don't buy into why the model is predicting what it's predicting, um, even in politics, right? So we've, saw, we've seen some of the elections being predicted, but if, if people didn't understand the why, they don't come behind, come around for a very long time. I think that the why part is where the explanations come in and hopefully we can bake in enough interpretation upfront our vision from open source perspective is with all with, uh, with a lot of eyes right so with many eyes all bugs are shallow in the same way with enough eyes all all um, bias is shallow we'll respond, we'll respond. if not um i'm going to switch gears slightly but before i do so i want to invite those listening to use the chat function on zoom to send questions our way the q a or chat we'll pick them up and do um is many answers as we can at the end of the session. I thought we should now switch and consider our third group of stakeholders, policymakers who have to sit over the system and contend with a lot of the issues around the transition to the use of AI models. Um, what does this all mean for them? What should they care about? And my first question, um, maybe for you, Jay, is when we think about the debates about machine learning underwriting models, you hear a lot about interpretable models only, Simple models are better. Yeah. Are they necessarily better from a fairness perspective? I would I'd just say no. So, so from a fairness perspective, the models, no matter how simple or complex, are just gonna reflect the patterns that are in the data. And if the data reflects patterns of disparate treatment or disparate impact, then that's going to be reflected in the model, no matter what kind of model it is. And so we see disparate impact in every kind of model. Uh, the question then becomes, can you identify the drivers and then what can you do about it? And I think um, uh, it's, it's really important to allow lenders the freedom from a regulatory perspective to do that exploration. And so um, I find um, uh, some lenders are more willing than others to engage in that discussion around the trade-offs between impact causing models and techniques that could help them mitigate those impacts. And, um, and that uh, even interpretable models, which on their face might seem uh, easier to understand, uh, end up being quite complex. Um, just, just to give a sort of simple example, a logistic regression model, which is a linear equation, still passes through an exponential uh, mathematically. And so when I go to pull that apart and try to understand what are the drivers of any change in the model score, it's actually quite complex. I would challenge anyone who sort of says that that model is uh, easily interpretable to actually do it. Uh, and so uh, I think while it might appear that way, uh, um, in reality, the, 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 it's quite different. Yeah, I would just like to add, like, I mean, just taking from what you said, so explanation function, of course, we all know that if you apply logarithm three, it becomes linear. 
But as long as, you know, you're saying interpretability is about explaining, focusing on the weight that comes out of the model, then probably, yeah, then it's interpretable, it's explainable. But I, will, I actually agree with you that having uh, simple or simpler models or even linear models does not necessarily imply you have fairness, right? So if we expand the, uh, the box or the scope of fairness to include uh, inclusiveness, like, right? And also if you think of privacy protection or protecting algorithms, definitely we want to be in favor of what we call complex models, right? Because what I have seen in practice is, uh, you know, those that we consider to be unscorable or uh, invisible, we could actually leverage alternative data, right? And most of the signals coming from these alternative attributes are not something you can actually interpret with simple or linear order. So definitely, we should be uh, looking into adopting or promoting complex machine learning models. I, I think that, I think I agree with both of you and that uh, there's, you don't know going into it. I mean, the simplest model is give everybody a loan right. or give everybody the <laughs> average score. Yeah, yeah. Uh, don't give anybody a loan. Uh, and, and maybe all of those are fair in one way or another. And, and so from that, you know, complexity, I don't know what that does, but I, I think that what's really important is going back to the data and seeing what's in the data. Because if you are putting a variable in that incorporates some sort of discrimination, you know, if, it, if your model is y equals x1, you know, beta times x1, <laughs> uh, and it, you're averaging over everybody, right? And let's say that x1 has some sort of idiosyncratic discrimination component. If you have a simple model, you're essentially gonna average out that discrimination and apply it to whites and blacks or whatever that the groups may be. When you take a, and this is under you know, various assumptions, make it a more complex model, that discrimination may no longer be averaged over everyone. It may actually be revealed through the complexity so that is problematic, but the flip side to that is, is we're talking about missingness of variables. If minorities in, or any protected class interacts with the credit system differently than the majority group, that averaging process of the model is going to potentially induce unfairness and discrimination. And in that case, a more complex model is a better model. So we don't know. And we don't know. And what that means is that testing is really testing. And then to Jay's point, every credit model has some sort of disparate impact. So that means, you know, there's a lot of opportunity for Jay. Yeah. Maybe for me. <laughs> uh, certainly for Michael. Sorry, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. Go ahead, so Mike. I'm going to talk a little bit through the argument for interpretability that finding drivers of bias might actually be easier. Now, I think that, I mean, I'm just continuing the conversation on simple, right? You know, I mean, even a simple rule engine, following just the basic rules of um, business uh, safety, giving lending to um, people with high income is, e is safer, can create um, disparate incomes, right? outcomes, right? So, so as a result, um, I mean, simplest rules have al also caused bias and, 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 ch and problems with fairness. But I think what simple allows us is right to ability to kind of go back to the first principles and uh, rinse repeat, right? Change different elements and see if the more if the, if the data in the data, and see for ourselves uh, as uh, kind of the model monitors, if you will, uh, humans on the loop, right? not just human in the loop, to actually go and get it get a way to kind of um, figure out what was wrong with the data to begin with, and then. Um, learn more about it. all these are kind of I mean, data is a representation of life, right? Sort of, um, and life is messy and and sparse. And how do you kind of um, kind of um, un our understanding about data, the sense of around data, gets better uh, if you're able to uh, come up with a similar, almost same class of accuracy using a simpler model. And I think that um, that strive striving toward that elegance, so you can go back to the first principles 
um, is is always useful. And so I think there's um, there's definitely value to that. Now, of course, um, deep learning models and um, black box multi-layer models hide a lot of that uh, away from traditional. Um, uh, the debuggability of the model becomes very much harder. During COVID, we saw a lot of these uh, predicting models as data was changing rapidly between the three waves. Um, our uh, uh, grandmasters from data science, Kaggle, they ended up actually uh, fully using the simplest models because data was changing so fast. And when conditions are changing fast, it's easier to understand um, the principal uh, components driving uh, the behavior and then those those were the models that were more successful than the deep complex uh, new, uh, methods that are yeah, uh, like so uh, I, I like to comment on uh Nate's uh statement about average you know right mm -hmm. and I think uh that brings us to the question about okay when it comes to fairness metrics do we want to just focus on group fairness metrics mm -hmm or individualized our benefits, right? Mm -hmm. So for example, in housing, one of the many reasons why we know we have problem is because we have discrimination, segregation and all that, right? Mm -hmm. But then to really solve some of these problems, we probably want to also focus on individualized metri fairness metrics because we want to make sure that people who are similarly situated, they also have equal access or equal opportunity. So that's what I just thought I should chime in, that we should also have conversations around using individualized metrics uh, in, uh, as we try to engineer some of this model so that it becomes fair. I just like to respond to the simpler is better point that you made. It's interesting to hear that uh, you say that. We've had models now in production that are ensembles of Neural networks and gradient boosted decision trees more. They, I, I would consider them some of our most complex models for for years. And um, I thought uh, coming into the pandemic that we were going to have to fit them all and do lots of uh, post hoc surgery on these models because they were uh, uh, they would be more sensitive to changes in distributions. But in fact, because uh, we built them uh, carefully and we screened the features and we selected down just to the ones that uh, mattered the most and uh, uh, deliberately constructed them to be stable over time uh, in uh, sort of adherence with the SR 11.7 OCC 11.12 guidance. And we put monitors in place. Those models have been humming along all throughout COVID without any uh, uh, need for any changes. So it's been interesting to sort of uh, see that bear out. I thought the opposite was going to happen too. Uh, but in fact, it hasn't. The complex models have delivered reliable performance even throughout a very uh, changing uh, uh, input distribution cycle. So I'd like to shift gears once again. And um, this the is challenge on PR and the challenge yeah, yeah. on COVID. I was going to be party on the challenge on COVID, yeah. which is more um, not party to um, uh, the actual comment there, but actually. Traditional um, features, which were highly predictive, like FICO scores or credit scores, were all uh, drifting upward for a very large part of the pop almost all of the population of um, their scores were drifting up. So they became almost unreliable during COVID. So it was actually um, a very interesting um, artifact of um, of the pandemic. We have never tested the models um, uh, for that kind of resilience. Absolutely. May I? May I? Of course. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Michael, I, I absolutely agree that you can't just think about the fairness that individual fairness is essential. But one of the things that I think is really important within the modeling context, and this is kind of an unusual thing to the modeling context, is everybody gets the same decision based on the factor. So, whether you're uh, you know, no matter what, who you are, you are going to get the same outcome. There's, there's no, the, the, the computer is not sitting there and making some additional judgment. What that means is that it's really great for transparency in that way, because if you have some sort of unfairness going on, you know exactly what 
is causing it because you know the variables that come into it. So if we're thinking about measuring individual fairness and you're saying we've got some, you know, typically what we'll see is essentially like a surrogate law being applied. And so you say, okay, I'm gonna see if this algorithm is fair. So I'm gonna include FICO, I'm gonna include tattooing, I'm gonna three or four more other things. I don't think that either proves or disproves anything because all you're doing is trying to make a surrogate for the, the model itself. And so if you see differences between those two, you know, that, that simple model with characteristics that, that you accept versus the complex machine learning model that's actually making credit decisions, what is different is caused by those factors. And so the question is, what, what of that difference is being caused by each of those factors? You can simplify that a lot by just saying, are those factors valid? Hmm. Well, okay, yeah, no, I, I think I, I can follow up with you to our conversations about um, why we should also uh, consider individualized our metrics. You know, as a civil rights organization, many of the complaints we have don't come to us in groups, right? So yeah. it's individuals who actually come to us. So if you could just visualize some data that is a CSV or Excel file, right? So you want to actually make sure that if I look at just randomly uh, picking two rows, if the two rows are similar, depending on what similarity metrics you're using, you also want to make sure that the outcomes coming out of the model are also similar. But I, uh, you know, I understand your point and definitely we can have uh, conversations after the fact. Yeah. Buster. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> okay, good. We'll take it offline. Uh, I want to roll you guys up a little bit. This conversation um, is happening at a very interesting and important time. We've all read scary news stories about AI and machine learning, and I um, have and do make arguments to the world that some of the legal requirements that we've talked about today about disparate treatment and disparate impact put boundaries between those horror stories and the world of credit underwriting. That doesn't mean the financial service world is without its own problems to account for. We know there's been discrimination and exclusion that affects the data and the decision-making about models. Um, we're also talking at a time when both in, in, in technology conversations, in market practice conversations, and in policy conversations, very consequential foundational choices are being made about what's gonna be possible for the use of AI in credit underwriting. I'd like to hear from each of you, what's the one big thing that you wish regulators, firms, consumers, other stakeholders understood better about fairness of machine learning models? Who wants to start? I'd like to go last. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that's a setup. I'll, 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 I'll pick this up. So, so um, uh, the first thing is that uh, machine learning models can be made more fair, uh, that they can be made to create uh, uh, better outcomes for everyone. In fact, they often do. And that, um, and that it's, it's possible to create the kinds of outcomes that we're all looking for by moving from a more traditional approach to machine learning modeling without introducing uh, significant risk. What regulators could do would be to clarify their position on uh, the usage of some of these advanced methods and techniques to take uh, disparate impact out of models and make it um, and encourage our lenders to do thorough searches for less discriminatory alternatives so that uh, so that everybody is leaving no so stone unturned when it comes to creating fairer outcomes. Three. I think that. Um... I mean, it's probably in data is as a, it's just a reflection of what we've done over the last many years, right? Sort of many decades. So, in so fairness, is that if our AI is reflecting a mirror that doesn't we don't like, then we need to go kind of down to fixing things at the level where uh, one the data can I mean we can start building better models. But I think bringing fairness and inclusion is a social, uh, I mean, it's just as much social as, as technological. And I think some of the comments yesterday we heard from several members, including Agus, as um, Michael was mentioning, is to bring the social technological 
thinking very early in the process not to put lipstick on something we didn't like, right? So, so I think the postdoc um, explanations are a crutch, um, but really we need to go down to the, uh, to the source and origins of bias and, and fairness. And machine learning is um, just making, uh, making that obvious. It's actually fixable. Human-induced bias is much harder to fix. ML, we can audit. Um, safety, bringing more safety, more validation, um, and it's never done, right? Sort of once you fix one uh, one um, exclusion of a of a protected class, um, you, you you have the next one to fix, right? So there's a continuous refinement that needs to happen. AI is continuously learning um, containers, and we have completely containerized this at scale. It can go and um, chisel down any problem we want to a more uh, consumable or solvable problem. But I think what we do need to kind of uh, take a holistic view in, in addressing um, fairness and bias across the whole class, uh, across the whole workflow that leads to a lending decision or uh, a, a decision based on AI. It, is, um, it, it, takes, uh, it takes a village. We, we need to get the business teams, the legal teams, the government, uh, policymakers, legislators, to not fear AI, right? Sort of AI, I mean, um, being educated be, uh, about AI. So we need to kind of um, go down to the grassroots, just like the meetups that led to the data science movement five, 10 years ago. We need the same level of hands-on workshops for legislators and senators and, and um, policymakers at every level. So we can make them not fear ML or AI. That's not the source of the problem. Uh, it, it certainly makes the problem widespread and can be applied and deployed at scale. So it's important to do it um, at the right pace for uh, society to adjust, but it's also uh, important to go back to the source and, and uh, get, a, get a holistic view on, on, and regulation is going to be important for regulated. Um, explainability is not just for regulators, but it's most certainly important for all practitioners. Yeah. So That's the one big thing. The, the one big thing is the, your paper, the Stanford Thin Regular paper, has done two things. One, it started something and it stopped something. I think it started a conversation on or pushed forward significantly a conversation on moral complexity, adverse action notices, interpretability. What I hope it stopped the conversation on was the question of can fair models be made? The answer is yes, we've shown that. It's no longer a couple of vendors, Jay and me, saying that it's out in, in print by right? right. real academics and uh, and thing like that. So I think that's really good. And whether you know you whatever bank or whatever a bank uses to do something to make things fair, that is great. But they can't hide behind the can't have. You know? That's right. All right, buckle up. Yeah. It's time for Mike Ock and Woomery. <laughs> so uh, we I'll, I'll start by saying I agree with most of uh, what we <laughs> Nick and uh, Jay mentioned. Now, uh, one thing I like us to uh, be conscious of is uh, we're talking about I state models, we actually, which actually uh, have uh, consequences for humans, right? So, and uh, I'll say uh, it's very, very important for regulators, agencies, and even corporate entities to stop playing chess game with human lives. It's very, very important. Like Nick mentioned, so there are innovative techniques, there are algorithmic uh, fairness methodologies and techniques. And if these techniques are just there, you know, gathering dust in different libraries and companies and all that, then uh, for example, in housing right now, we're talking about the home ownership gap between black people and white people keeps uh, growing relative to 50 or uh, 50 years ago. And also the wealth gap uh, keeps growing. We need to take advantage or leverage uh, these innovative technologies. Otherwise, maybe in another 50 years, the uh, image could actually uh, be really, really uh, blurry, right? So I would say when it comes to taking advantage of these uh, uh, innovative technologies, we actually have five considerations. There's policy considerations. Uh, there's legal and uh, regulatory expectations where we lean on our agencies to actually provide guidance, right? 
And then there's also operational considerations and uh, very, very important reputational considerations. And uh, I would say on the list, most important is human consideration. Because I always say data tells stories of real people, right? So as we have these uh, PNS uh, methodologies, our regulators or policymakers should provide guidance. There should be relief, justice, and compensation mechanisms or guidelines, right? Because when it comes to when you ask financial institutions why they are not taking advantage of these uh, the biasing techniques, it's probably going to be due to the fact that they are afraid of what uh, you know the legal consequences will be in terms of compensation. So we need guidance from our regulators and agencies on providing this mechanism so that the financial institutions can start taking, uh, leveraging uh, these, these techniques. And the second uh, um, uh, comment that I also have even for the corporate entities is to engage civil rights organizations more. Have conversations, we talk about interpretability, explainability and all that. Come down to the level so that at least they can really begin to see the benefits and advantages of uh, some of these techniques. That's what I asked. Great. Um, I'm going to roll up a couple of inquiries from the floor about regulatory oversight and the processes. Now, I think we would all agree that um, regulatory agencies and financial services, probably across the board, need a new generation of regulators who um, include some data scientists and lawyers and others who speak model at least as a second language to sort of really contend with these issues. But let's think about the processes they use when they do an examination. What kind of tools do they need? What kind of information? And is there an argument that when we think about something about less discriminatory alternatives, they should be really validating what they see, generating their own to see if they can do better than what the firm did itself? That would be, I, from my perspective, that would be fantastic. I think um, arming the regulators with the same tools that the modeling teams and fair lending analytics teams have at the institutions uh, would really level the playing field and it would open up, um, I, I think, uh, um, efficiencies in that exam process so that um, they could make use of automated tools to screen for disparate treatment to identify whether or not uh, an attribute that's used in a model is highly correlated with a protected basis uh, automatically um, versus simply looking at the natural language description that was used in the model of risk documentation and relying on that. Statistical tests can be automated, they can be, uh, and they could drive efficiencies in the exam process, which would be a benefit both to the institutions, the financial institutions, and the agencies. What do you say? All right. Um, we, with that, we, we've actually seen, we have actually seen like SEBI in India, uh, Singapore, um, even Middle East, Dubai. Many of the regulatory agencies are actually big users of our automatic ma machine learning to benchmark machine learning methods. They're like paying, almost paying customers, to be honest, because they want to be as advanced in trying to learn AI and regulate to regulate AI. Eventually, we want to use uh, enough. How do how do people how are people kept in check by other people around for social construct context? And I think long term, that's how models are going to be in check by keeping other models to regulate the, uh, the AI methods we're using. So ultimately we'll see auditing and governance become so important that we'll try to use the best technology, whether it's AI or uh, other ways to regulate AI. So if I could just, uh, I agree with what you said, your last comment, but I also like to have uh, independent auditors or independent uh, nonprofit organizations to the mix. So as we try, to, as we trust our regulators with our intellectual properties, we want to harm them, like give the uh, your automation or automated tools to them. We should be doing the same thing with our independent auditors and organizations so that we can actually foster trust around uh, some of these. 